Hi, right, Chuck. We got it. Time for the rant of the month. I'm very pleased to have Lisa Moreno here, who is the uh, president of the uh, AAEM. And I wanted to get everybody's point of view on all of these kind of nasty things that are happening to emergency medicine. So, Dr. Moreno, welcome and thank you for uh, taking my call. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, last month, I had uh, Jillian uh, Schmidt and um, I'm black in her name. The, I think it's Carla, the president of uh, AAEM. I mean, the, the Residency Association and got their points of view on the issues that we're having. And I'd like to talk about, first of all, this issue of um, advanced practice clinicians in the emergency department. Uh, AAEM, I think was one, one of the first organizations to come out with a rather very direct um, uh, response to the growing number of paramedics and emergency, not paramedics. Hey, listen, listen, Dave, I'm gonna start over. That, that's a, that was a mess. Hi, Chuck. Hi, Chuck, we got a time for the rant of the month. Uh, my guest this month is Lisa Moreno, who is the uh, president of uh, AAEM. Uh, Lisa, thank you for joining uh, us today and uh, uh, contributing to this con uh, ongoing thing we're having with regard to the staffing and emergency departments. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Lisa, um, what I know that AAEM was one of the first organizations, if not the first, to have a very sp specific uh, policy you know, dis disseminated with regard to their view of APPs in the emergency department. Could you kind of re restate that position and, and has it evolved over the uh, probably year that it's been out there? So our policy statement has not evolved. It remains the same and our policy statement is very clear. We are 100% opposed to the independent practice of um, advanced practice uh, providers in the emergency department or frankly uh, anywhere in healthcare. Um, we believe that a board certified physician should lead every single healthcare team. And the reason for that is that, um, first of all, we don't use the word advanced practice providers. We use the word at AAM, NPP or non-physician professional. We don't like the word provider either because the word provider was coined in order to deceive the public into thinking that all healthcare professionals are equal, that there's no difference between a nurse practitioner, a PA or a physician. And that is deceptive to the public there is a huge difference. The major difference being in the length, the quality, and the standardization of the training that these individuals undergo. So no one undergoes the kind of training that uh, the physician undergoes. It's not, uh, their training is not standardized and regulated the way ours is. And we believe that every patient deserves the highest standard of care and that standard of care is provided by a board certified physician. So definitely PAs, paramedics, um, nurse practitioners all have a role in providing health care, but that health care must be provided under the supervision of a board certified physician. And that is our position. It has not evolved. It will not change until there are drastic changes, unless and until there are drastic changes in the training um, of other healthcare professionals. It seems that the uh, nurse practitioners in pa uh, have been quite uh, successful in getting states to uh, allow them to uh, practice independently. Uh, California just uh, passed a rule. Uh, I think it's effective actually today in January that about the uh, independent practice of uh, nurse practitioners. You know, I, I think that there's two kinds of independent practice that I see. All, many emergency departments have the NPs or PAs seeing what they call minor cases and, and virtually see, seeing them alone um, where, where, you know, physicians may get to sign a bunch of charts at the end of the shift, but they never saw those patients. And, uh, I view that myself personally as a, a, a bit of independent practice because none of those patients uh, were seen by a physician. And I personally believe, it's kind of old fashioned, I'm sure, that 
everybody in the ER deserves the right to be seen by a physician. And even if it's just for uh, uh, a affirmation of what's been done by the uh, PA or NP in terms of their care, if it was a, you know, a minor IND or something like that, uh, so that they know that a physician is involved in the team in a very tangible way, not just that they're signing charts at the end of the shift, which I think is pretty ridiculous to tell you the truth. Uh, well, I other- agree with you. And I agree with you in that. And the AAM agrees with you. First, first of all, anyone who's ever worked in an emergency department knows that something that is deemed a minor case may turn out not to be a minor case. I have sent patients to the OR from the fast track. I have had patients um, put into the fast track who ended up being uh, being septic or having uh, something seriously wrong with them. So, uh, and also if you sign a chart, um, you're saying that you provided true supervision for that case, uh, so you should do so. And, and again, you use the word that we use as well, which is that every patient deserves to have the highest standard of care and deserves to be seen by a board certified emergency physician. You know, our greatest concern is that the most vulnerable patients, meaning people who live in rural areas, people who uh, don't speak English, people who are uninsured, underinsured, people of color are going to be the ones that are going to not have a choice about who they see and are going to be seen by the less qualified, lesser trained individuals. And these patients usually are the ones with more complicated medical situations. And so um, it's not a good setup. It's going to increase healthcare disparities tremendously. I think there's a a little resentment uh, when uh, the physicians feel that they need to uh, see all the patients. But I personally believe that you know, when you come into an emergency department, you're not going to an urgent care center. If you if you had a, a minor enough problem and and you were in an urban area, you could go to urgent care. Once you get into the ER, you're in a, a different uh, uh, setting that is, I think, where the expectations in the bar is quite high in terms of what is expected. And um, I also know that the frankly the bills in the emergency department are quite a, quite. Uh, hi, I think that the average bill is somewhere around $1,600. Uh, and 80% of our patients go home. So right. uh, they're getting concierge level charges from the hospital and uh, not necessarily from the physician, but certainly the hospital. And I think they kind of deserve, <laughs> you know, the physician to come and say, hi, how, how are you doing? And uh, uh, nurse so-and-so, uh, the, the PA is going to, need to be checking your wound and I'll be uh, uh, back to see you uh, uh, in, a, in a bit. So that they got, they have the sense that they are a part of a, a, a team process whereby the, the PA is gonna help, the nurse is gonna help, uh, the doc's gonna be there. And under that, under that um, premise, I can envision a physician, you know, supervising an, a number of PAs, but um, and I know that that's really a lot of economically driven. But the other place that people, uh, PAs and NPs, may work alone is these rural settings, where it would be very difficult to have an emergency physician go out there. Um, other than a visit every once in a while, and and. What, what, what's your stand on that, given the fact that they're willing to do it? There, many times there's no other choice in, in the uh, local community to have emergency physicians out there. So it's better, that's better than nothing, I would think. Well, you know, that's an interesting uh, question because this is the way that a lot of these nurse practitioner organizations have gotten independent practices, right. that they tell legislators that they're willing to go to rural areas and areas that are underserved. And when you look at the actual demographics, that's not true. That is not true. They are not choosing to go and practice in undesirable areas any more than physicians are choosing to go to practice in undesirable areas. So this is again, deceptive where they are putting it out there to the public and putting it out there to legislators that they are willing to go to those areas, but they don't. They don't go to those areas. So 
there are creative solutions. There are certain practice groups that we're aware of, not just in emergency uh, care, but also even in pediatrics, in family practice and internal medicine, where individuals get together and they form a democratic group. And it is agreed that each member of that practice, so they rent a condo or something mm -hmm. in some rural underserved area, and each member of the practice has to go there for what, whatever the practice agrees mm -hmm. upon, one month a year, um, you know, one, one week every two or three months. But, you know, this ends up so that nobody ends up having to be single in an area where there's nothing to do at night or have children in an area where they're not going to get a high quality education. You end up just going to this rural area or this underserved area for part of your practice time. And it's not widespread, I will admit that, but groups that have done it are saying that it works. And it then makes it a little bit more appealing to serve those areas. And um, I mean, let's face it, we all wanna do the right thing. We all wanna take care of patients who are not being taken care of. We all wanna make sure that everybody has equal access to the highest level of care. But if you're thinking about sacrificing your whole life for that, it's not so appealing, but if you're thinking about doing it one month a year, that makes it a little bit more appealing, a lot more appealing. Right, I, there would be also the necessity to have the funding to uh, support that. But um, I do know places which are staffed solely by PAs. I know a place in uh, upstate New York and the fellow comes to our courses every year, year after year after year. And he's really very, very uh, knowledgeable. Um, they say they they have no other options uh and sure they'd love to have uh, a, a physician particularly an emergency physician help out but um uh, and their supervisor is really not particularly uh reachable so they're pretty much on their own and so and i think it's probably happening in, in a fair number of places because the solution that you've uh suggested really needs a kind of uh, be more than just, I think, a, a local group. I think that it needs to be kind of the responsibility of the of the state or the feds to help cover the cost of this. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Uh, I would agree with that. The other thing I wanted to uh, talk about is this um, workforce uh, study that was done by ASEP and released about, I don't know, about three months ago or four months ago. And I think it's really getting a lot of people kind of concerned. Uh, what, are, what, what are your thoughts on this potential glut of emergency physicians? So we do know that there's gonna be a glut of emergency physicians. The AAM also did that same study that ASEP did. We did it two years earlier and came to the exact same conclusions that there is going to be a glut of emergency physicians. Um, all of the organizations are working collaboratively right now to try to influence the ACGME to raise the standards of residency training in order that there will not be such a proliferation of emergency medicine residency training programs. Within the past few years, there has been a massive proliferation of emergency medicine training programs and um, most of those training programs are training programs that are run by corporate medical groups, which do not have uh, a lot of experience in medical education, do not have a lot of experience in medical uh, research. And we are all aware of certain circumstances in which they hire a research director and fly that person around to seven different sites. Um, that person really doesn't have an integral role in getting to know the residents and be a meaningful part of their training. And all of us are speaking out against this. Um, we feel that if the quality um, of residency programs is, the bar is raised to ensure that there is higher quality of training provided to future emergency physicians, that ultimately a lot of these uh, groups that have been formed just for the purpose of having cheap labor or just for the purpose of training uh, young physicians in their model of practice, in their corporate model of practice, so that they can have future employees. Um, some of these will just buy, will just drop out when it doesn't become as profitable. 
or some of them will be screened out if the ACGME raises the standards. And all of us have been working collaboratively. We're all, we're all reviewing a document that we've collectively put together that recommends to the ACGME that the standards be raised. That certainly will have an impact um, on the workforce issue and the predicted glut of emergency physicians. We know that there's going to be a physician shortage in the United States going forward. Um, but based on the predictions, there's going to be a surplus of emergency physicians. But it'll be interesting to see how that pans out, because if less people continue to go into primary care and more patients continue to use the emergency department for primary care, we may find there's not as much of a glut as is being predicted. But that depends on a lot of these other factors as well. Yeah, it seems that uh, all of these uh, proposals are going to certainly take time to uh, play out. And in the meantime, I, I, you know, I, the glut, I think, is already to a certain extent begun because obviously if they're talking about a glut of 10,000 physicians in 2030, well, it's not going to happen all in one year. It's going to be progressive from, from this year to next year to the year after that. Each year, there's going to be more graduates who are having difficulty finding the jobs that they, certainly the jobs that they would like. Um, and maybe they will be you know, forced by economics to take some of the jobs that are, you know, less appealing at the time. And I think that that may affect um, who applies to be uh, an emergency physician now in terms of we, I was of the generation where it was the best and the brightest uh, who are applying and that, that was true for decades. Um, and I'm concerned that when physicians coming out of uh, medical school look at the uh, potential for a, a, a livelihood that they may get discouraged if in fact this uh, workforce issue does, does materialize. Well, you know, you, you're saying the best and the brightest were the ones who were attracted to emergency medicine and um, you have to be the brightest physician in the pack if you are gonna work in an emergency department because we are the only physicians who see completely undifferentiated patients. We are the only physicians who see patients who don't know their own medical history and we may not have access to that medical history. And so you absolutely have to be the smartest. You absolutely have to be the best doctor to work in an emergency department. But when you look at the factors that are driving this alleged glut, some of that I mentioned, are these uh, residencies springing up that are run by corporate groups. But if you also look at the way corporations run their emergency departments, where they are hiring undertrained nurse practitioners and PAs for independent practice, taking positions that could have been given to physicians, yes, uh, at a higher rate of pay. So that would cost more money for the corporation, which goes against to their goal of making profits for their stockholders. Um, but, but it goes towards the goal of giving the best care to our patients. The other thing they do is they advertise for FPs and internal medicine physicians to work in the emergency department. And they pay them less than they pay emergency physicians. So again, they're meeting their goal of making money for their stockholders. They are not meeting the goal of giving optimal care to the patients. And they are throwing us back to the 1980s when people believed that anybody could do the job of an emergency physician. We have struggled so hard. All of us, um, you know, starting with ASAP, has struggled so hard to get the message across to the public that not anybody can do this job. There is a specific skill set, there is a specific knowledge base, there is a specific communication skill that goes with being an emergency physician. And ABEM is definitely leading the charge and AAM absolutely um, is supporting it, that, that you, these corporations should not be advertising for non-board certified emergency physicians to practice in the emergency department because it is unfair to the public. And it is throwing us back, like I said, to the 1980s where we perpetrated this myth that anybody could do what an emergency physician does, and that is not true. Barbara Katz does a survey that is published in uh, Emergency Medicine News, but it, all, it is also um, distributed uh, to other of the papers that we get. And uh, 
it showed, uh, and this was only like about two years ago, that at least uh, a third and probably a little more of the uh, uh, openings that were available for uh, physicians were in emergency medicine were accepting primary care physicians yeah. as well. And yeah. you would have thought that, well, I was really shocked at the number. It was maybe even 40%. And it's like, wow, uh, I, I thought I would have thought that that would have uh you know, been a much lower number uh, looking for primary care physicians to work in emergency departments. So no, we're well aware of that. It is, it is at least a third. And that is shameful. It's absolutely shameful because it does increase the profits that the corporation makes, but it decreases the quality of care that's provided to our patients. And our patients should be first. Yeah, I did primary care for a couple of years in the Indian Health Service, and emergency medicine is very different from primary care, uh, that's for sure. Uh, any final thoughts? Well, I think that one of the other things that we, uh, you know, that we didn't talk about is the fact that um, emergency medicine also qualifies us to expand to other areas. We're seeing a whole lot more uh, global disasters and emergency physicians are ideal to lead teams um, that respond to disasters. We are also ideal for leading teams for event management because we're prepared for anything, anytime, any place. And the other thing is telemedicine. There's been a lot of expansion of telemedicine during the COVID pandemic. And actually the emergency physician is probably the ideal kind of doctor to do telemedicine because again, you're getting undifferentiated patients, you're getting everything under the sun. And, um, and I certainly wouldn't want an obstetrician gynecologist to be talking to a patient about their blood pressure medications um, on telemedicine. But what we offer to telemedicine is the option of being able to look at a patient and decide whether we can reassure them decide whether we can do what we do when we're face-to-face -face in the emergency department, which is to get them seen by their primary care physician or in one of our clinics in a certain period of time that we deem is appropriate, or for us to say, I'm sending an ambulance to come and get you because you actually need to be seen by me directly. So we're ideal for expanding into a lot of other areas. You know, one of the areas that I've been thinking about is, um, hospitalists. Now, it, it, there is an issue about, well, what credentials would we have to be hospitalists? It's kind of interesting that the American Board of uh, Internal Medicine has an exam that uh, that you can take to basically show uh, additional competency. It's not, a, it's not a fellowship or anything like that, where you, uh, uh, if you take their exam, whether you're being an internist or a family physician, uh, you can, if you take their exam, you have some credential to uh, be a hospice. And I was thinking, geez, you know, I think that emergency physicians, maybe with some additional uh, um, training, but certainly not a fellowship, could go into the area of hospice because a, a few ER groups, well, um, well, a modest number, also have hospice programs, but they don't necessarily hire emergency physicians to do it. They hire internists to do it. But I, my sense is that we have a lot more capability now, especially now that we're taking care of people in the observation units. It's like uh, we're, we're gradually expanding. And if we could get into the world of hospitalists, I think that we would have a really very positive relationship between the hospitalists and the emergency physicians, which does not always exist in the, 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 med, uh, the relationships that exist now and um, that we wouldn't need to have fellowships because I don't think people want to do, want to go back and do a fellowship, but I think that if we can otherwise get acknowledged by uh, the, uh, well, it's the American Board of Internal Medicine, but you know, it's a common test that the, these folks take that if we could, took the test, we could say, listen, we took that test and we passed too. So we can be a hospitalist and that's our credentials to work in the hospital. Uh, because I think there's a lot of opportunities in the world of hospitals. And certainly in terms of doing procedures in the hospital, there's probably nobody better uh, than the emergency physicians. And 
if st something starts to go r bad in the hospital, there's probably nobody better than the, the emergency physician to be there. So I think that emergency physicians offer a lot of uh, skills that are valuable for to being a hospitalist. And I think that the things that they may be not so strong on, they, they could certainly uh, get up to speed quite quickly. And there are a lot of hospitals, especially in rural areas where the emergency physician is the only doc in the hospital right. overnight and is responding right. anyway to all the needs for intubation, the codes, whatever mm -hmm. else goes on on the floor. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, one last point. I, I've been reading about um, the idea of now that there seems to be such a shortage of nurses uh, to work in the emergency department, that um, then an option may be to have paramedics uh, come into the hospital and help out, uh, primarily on the giving the medicine, starting the IVs, uh, not necessarily acting as a PA or NP. And, you know, they would probably be in uh, under the wing of the medical director and maybe answer to the uh, nursing director in some way. But uh, it seems that these people give drugs, they intubate in the dark, on the, in the rain kind of thing, and they are not allowed to cross the threshold of the emergency department to do anything. It, uh, you know, phlebotomy, they, they have a lot of skills. And I think it would be very reasonable for them to come out and help out not as a clinician to, to examine patients or the like, but to do, there's a whole bunch of things that they could help with. But each of those is a state by state kind of thing uh, where the state would have to, the local uh, chapters of ASAP and AAEM would need to petition the state to allow that happen. And I think a lot of P, uh, uh, paramedics would be up for it. I think a lot of them would too. And I think those technical skills that they have that uh, that are absolutely essential to patient care, um, there is a role for that. I'm gonna say something that may be considered a little bit controversial, but um, I think there's also a role for residents to learn those skills. I haven't been out of my EM residency all that long. I finished in 2004. And when I um, did my EM residency, we started our own IVs, we drew our own blood, um, we mixed our own nebulizer treatments for patients. We mixed a lot of the medications and hung them ourselves. We transported patients. I don't think that I am any the worse for having learned those skills. And I, I'm often very chagrined when I, I have a resident now who comes to me and says that they're going to switch um, an antibiotic order from IV to PO. And I'm like, and why is that? And they'll say, well, the nurse couldn't get the IV. And then the IV team came down and they couldn't get the IV. And I'm like, no, 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 no. If you think the patient needed IV antibiotics, then the patient needs IV antibiotics. And you're the doctor, you need to be the one to get in there and get a line. And certainly, you know, yeah, we can put in a central line, we can put in, you know, an EJ. There are a lot of other things that we can do, but, but I am very chagrined to find that I have students graduating from medical school who've never started an IV in their lives, who've never put a Foley catheter in in their lives. As an emergency physician, I have had to get down on my hands and knees on the floor by an elevator without an ultrasound machine and put in a subclavian line on a patient. Um, who collapsed. I mean, these are things that we need to be able to do. So I know that this comment is going to be deemed very controversial, but I think there is a role for teaching some of those skills to residents and having residents help with some of these things as well. Well, you know, one of the, my uh, concerns relating to children is I wonder how many residents now graduate having done uh, any pediatric lumbar punctures, no less a a bunch because you know the meningitis thing is due to the immunologist is is largely uh, gone away. I mean it's not it's there, but the the yield on looking for meningitis in these uh, sick kitties is really small. And mm -hmm. so uh, um, it's like I can see that that thing we used to do when I was at, uh, uh, in practice 
clinically, we used to do them all the time. And, and, and gradually we've evolved out of that. It's like we used to do these, uh, uh, called the synthesis in in women you know we, yep. we graduated out of that thanks to the ultrasound machine uh but I, I i do think that you know being in the emergency department and just seeing it and experiencing you can learn a lot um and i think that we need to find some other sources of help because you know that right now we've got all, everybody not <laughs> they're not at the hospital. They're either uh, they've got exposure to COVID and they're basically, you know, can't come in or they don't want to work in the uh, hospital anymore because it's become too much of a stressful situation and dealing with the same kind of patients day after day after day or the, or the sheer volume of patients just kind of gets to you and say, I don't want to do this anymore, which is kind of a, a shame. So we, we have our challenges, that's for sure. And uh, it's nice to know that you and your colleagues are, you know, collectively working. And I, and, and I inter, um, interviewed Jillian Schmidt uh, last month, and she made it very clear that the, all of these organizations are working uh, collaboratively to try to uh, deal with the, the um, existential crisis that we're, I think we're facing. Uh, any last thoughts? Well, I, I think that um, I'd like to, to kind of comment on um, Dr. Schmidt's comment that you mentioned that, yes, I think we are recognizing that our um, common ground and our similarities are far greater than our differences and we are working collaboratively. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is, this is a good thing that has come out of this, as you call it, the existential crisis in emergency medicine is that we've realized that we're all emergency physicians. We all share the goal of doing the best thing for every patient every single time. And we are working together. And I would be remiss as a woman who has spent most of my career doing a lot of diversity work and a, a lot of healthcare disparities work. I would be remiss if I did not point out that one of the other amazing things that has happened this year is every major emergency medicine organization is led by a woman. And, um, and we are working <laughs> together as women, as mothers um, to, try to do what is best for our residents, our students, and our patients. You know, I, I really think that's true. I think there, women bring something to the, to the table that frankly men, that men don't bring. And I think women are more likely to be able to get things done often than men, men are. I don't wanna to be too sexist about it, but um, I've known Jillian for uh, a number of years and I can't envision a more capable president for ASAP than Jillian. I mean, she's got such a skill skill set. And so I'm really proud that she's uh, the president. I think it's terrific. And uh, I think that a lot of women in emergency medicine will look up to uh, you and she and say, you know, I can do this too. And that's right. You know, and that's a, what we she's want. A mom and she's, you know, I don't know yes. if you're a mom, but you know, it's, yes. it's, it's, it's like you got like three jobs, you got to be a uh, a mother, you got to be a wife, you got to be uh, emergency physicians. So uh, I'm, I'm very admiring of uh, uh, physicians, women physicians who, you know, said, say, you know, I think I can do that. And, and, and sure enough, they've got great skills. Yes. And this so, is what we want. We want younger women to look at us and say, if she can do it, I can do it. This yeah. is absolutely doable. You know, um, I'm a firm believer and I've said all my career that I think it's critically important for children and for young, young uh, people in high school, college, medical school. If you can see it, you can be it. If you see somebody who looks like you, if you meet somebody whose life has had a similar trajectory to yours um, and you can see the fact that they've become successful, that they've become a leader, um, it, it increases the, uh, the options in your mind that you can do this too. And, and, you know, I've spoken with Jillian, I've spoken with um, Mary Nan and Mary Ann at, at ABEM. Um, I've spoken with Amy at SAEM, with Tiffany at CORD, and all of us feel that way. We want younger women to look at us 
and say, I can do that too. Yes, I think that collectively you've been a, a great um, shot in the arm for the position of women in leadership. Uh, and I think that it's personally, I think it's terrific. Uh, Dr. Marina, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I enjoyed meeting you. Uh, we haven't met before, and you're um, representing the AAEM and the work that they do. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for creating this opportunity, and thank you for generating this dialogue about this really important content in emergency medicine. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.